Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2021 Josef Schumpeter Innovation in Enterprise Lecture. The 2021 lecture is the sixth of its kind. And this year's Schumpeter Lecture is special in many ways. She is our first Slovenian. She is our second Nobel laureate amongst the guest speakers. And she is the third woman giving the lecture. And she is the first non-economist giving a lecture named after famous economists. You might have asked yourself why we invited an agrometeorologist to speak to the SME assembly. And I would like to answer you with a, with a quote from Josef Schumpeter himself. We always plan too much and always think too little. We resent a call to thinking and hate unfamiliar argument that does not tally with what we already believe or would like to believe." Unquote. Tonight, we are going to hear unfamiliar argument and we will be invited to think. We will be invited to think about climate change and what it means for our economy as a whole and even more what it means for our small and medium-sized enterprises. And so I would like to welcome to do you, I would like you to welcome with me Professor Luchka Kaifesh Pogotai. Good evening. Thank you for this applause. Uh, I'm very honored by this invitation, uh, especially uh, being non-economist. And uh, may I warn you at the beginning that I'm not a very diplomatic person. I'm coming from natural sciences, and uh, usually we speak physical truths, which is sometimes inconvenient. Okay, so the title. The title, we all know about climate crisis, and uh, I'm wondering, is climate crisis also a business crisis? And uh, I don't expect uh, to find the answer to this question tonight, but I just want you to think about it. Okay, so let me start with a cliche. Uh, when I was a little girl, I remember landing on the moon, and I remember the spirit of that time that it is just a matter of time when we will go to Mars, when we will find another planet we can live on. Uh, many years after that, we know that we were born on this planet and we will die on this planet. It's all that we have got because good planets are hard to find. But is our Earth like this or is it under the pressure? Of course, you know the answers. There are many pressures. I will not start with climate change, but growing human pressure which arises from the number of the people, from lifestyle, and especially from inequality. Because 20% of the people own 80% of the planet. Well, in an uh, allegoric way. Okay, we have climate change. Some people still think it's a dilemma. Uh, what concentration of CO2 is safe. Believe me, there's no dilemma, but I will discuss that later. Already we have consequences because ecosystems are declining. Uh, well, in Europe, we don't feel that. But remember your travel abroad, and actually we lost almost more than a half of the nature, if I may call it so. And COVID was a surprise, but there are many surprises maybe out there. That's why we have to be resilient, because science doesn't know all the problems in advance, but climate change 
we know. So low probability, but high impact events, we've just gone through the COVID, or are we still going actually through the COVID crisis? Uh, and climate change is a really large issue. Uh, it's not just about science, uh, hard science, social science. It's about business and industry. It was very clear in Glasgow, which I will comment later, there were a lot of people lobbying in Glasgow. There were more lobbyists maybe there than scientists, for sure. Every citizen, every politician, every public expert has a role to play in the future. Uh, and of course, every uh, piece of the economy will be changed during the time. And for those who are very young here, you know, your jobs in the future will be touched. Your health will be touched. Politics is already touched and also national security. This is something unpleasant, but sometimes we have to say it aloud. COVID and climate change, do they have anything in common? Unfortunately, yes. What they do not have in common is there is no vaccine for climate change, which makes climate change even more dangerous. But what do they have in common? We actually saw uh, the reaction of the whole world, how resilience was mostly undermined by deep inequality. Inequality still exists. There are five billion people out there unvaccinated. So we have to think broad. We saw how COVID shaked energy, food, and financial systems in many ways. And also, multilateral cooperation did not always worked as we hoped so. And the most important thing I learned about COVID was that it was a risk in plain sight, but we ignored it. I remember in uh, Davos, what, at World Economic Forum, they do analysis every year of the risks. And pandemics was always second or third on the list, but we ignore it. And many people still ignore climate change as well. Why is it so hard to ignore it? Because it's just a problem that is growing and growing. It is cumulative. And, okay, let's say COVID situation will end. It will be sort of reversible process, but climate change will not end. And what we do today, it is a problem of our children, grandchildren, and even generation beyond that. And, of course, it is a global problem. You cannot escape from climate change. Nobody can. So we know that there are so many indicators. Why I'm showing you this note, I don't want to educate you about uh, climate change measurements or monitoring. But unfortunately, there is still a lot of, sorry, a lot of climate skeptics saying that meteorologists, this is my profession, made up uh, all the, the facts. But actually, we hear more problems from biologists, from glaciologists, from marine scientists, because they are observing a world that is warming up. And the most crucial thing on this panel you can see is the last one. Ocean heat content has grown up. What does it mean? What is it so crucial? Because when you warm up the oceans, you cannot escape climate change anymore. It is here to stay. Even if humans are wiped up of the earth this moment, 3,000 years at least, would still we will have above normal uh, temperatures. So yes, we have a lot of indicators, a lot of measurements, and we are very confident what we are talking about. So how did we get into this mess? Uh, well, we all know that uh, lifestyle has something to do with it, energy has something to do with it, but he, you can see the combination here. So remember, you as a members of a uh, developed world, your mine also, of course, personal energy need per day is one gigajoule. And it is three times more than my father or my grandfather used. Why? Because if you see the upper part of the last column, we are obsessed by mobility. Well, mobility is for sure important, but our generation is obsessed. And of course, mobility so far is fossil fuel. Uh, fossil fueled. Uh, the second part of the 
Economy is economy. It's actually what makes economy grow. And what makes economy grow is not necessarily that when we buy things we need. What makes economy grow in the last decade is that we buy what we want to have. And there's a huge difference between our need and our want to have. So yes, we need much more energies because of that. The green part of the column is how we live. We have bigger flats, we have warmer flats, we have two flats. We have offices which are warmed in the winter and we have flats, so of course, much more energy. And the bottom is our stomach. I believe that our stomach physiologically is absolutely the same when in Romans 2,000 years ago, but we need double uh, the amount of energy. Why? Because we eat much more meat and because we throw food away. Food waste is still a problem all over the world. So yes, something went wrong with this large generation and it's not just about increase of personal use, but whatever we did for the last decades after the Second World War, when we actually entered in the epoch called now Anthropocene, is going exponentially up on the planet, which does not grow. So this is physically impossible and we have problems. So it's not just our energy personal need, it's about water, it's about paper, it's about telephones, it's about tourism. Okay, tourism did, had problems with last year, but anyway, it will grow very soon again. So you, we should not well wonder where did climate change arise from what? Yes, it is our way of living and of course the number of people as well. Energy. So the first problem is our lifestyle. But the second problem is the ch our choice of energy, which is unfortunate from climate change point of view, wrong. So our life is still based on coal, black, on oil, yellow, on gas, in red, and this is all fossil. Okay, we have some energy that is not fossil, but in the world uh, average, is not uh, more than 10 to 15 percent. So how to turn that down? So this is the second part of the problem. But the third part is that we actually use this fossil energy in a very primitive way. I'm sorry, but are we any different than cavemen? When they feel cold, they put something on fire. They burn something. What are we doing? Okay, we have different, more sophisticated burning, but we burn fossil fuels. And result of burning is threefold. It's water vapor, which is not a problematic. It's air pollution, which is extremely problematic, but not a, I will not talk uh, tonight about air pollution. But air pollution, by the way, yearly kills more people than COVID. Not in Europe, but worldwide. And the third product of burning fossil fuel is CO2. So we are burning fossil fuels every day. We use fossil fuels that was made during the process of photosynthesis for 500 days. So every year, humanity uses the energy from the past, uh, for the, uh, from the past, so every year, 500 years back. And of course, when you burn it, you have this quick increase in CO2 concentration. So it's going up and up, regardless negotiators, which negotiate for 27 years now, but atmosphere doesn't feel anything about it. So we actually increased uh, CO2 concentration practically in geological second. Because when you look million years ago, our atmosphere never had such a high concentration of CO2, which is direct consequence of burning. So this is the control knob, because temperature and CO2 are like this. Whenever it goes CO2 up, uh, temperature falls. And of course, in the warmer world, it's not just about warming, it's about changes of water cycle, which changes everything. And water cycle, when it changes, we have much more extremes and much more impacts very visible. Everywhere, from poles to the equator, 
with the rich countries, poor countries. So climate change is not choosing. But yes, in developed countries, we are more able to cope with it. In developing countries, they are not. Climate change is not fair. It is deeply, deeply unfair. Those nations who did not cause the problem are bearing the worst impacts. Children who are not even born yet will have to live with climate change. So it is really, really unfair. What about future? Futures. I don't use future in singular anymore because we have futures. Everything is possible. We can raise further the concentration of CO2. We can reach thousands of ppm if we keep on burning coal and so on. Okay, we can also slow down a bit our fossil fuel obsession and we can end up with 40, 450 ppm, but the resulting curve, you can see its temperature, more CO2, the higher temperature. Europe decided years ago in Lisbon Treaty that two degrees increase is supposed to be safe. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Yes, it is better than four, but this is all we can say. Because two degrees warming is already very dangerous. Maybe we can adapt to two. Because two globally is for Slovenia three and a half, for Austria three and a half, for Germany already four, and maybe for Sweden it's already five. So don't be fooled by world averages. Uh, three is chaos, and four is actually hard to say what. Something that is totally incomp incompatible with organized global community. So futures are out there. And is two degrees safe? You probably now already feel it's not. You can see the map, the darker the color, the more people will suffer. And when suffering is too high, these people turn to climate change refugees. We have seen that in other contexts, but many people who flee Syria in the first migrant wave, they experienced mega drought in Syria. What is mega drought? This is drought that does not end. It just continuously for five years. So ask farmers in Syria how it all began. And ask yourself, can Europe withstand 40 millions of future refugees, which is an estimate by UN? I guess we cannot. So two degrees, believe me, is not safe at all. Okay, maybe I, my language is too scientific, but this is very practical. This I use for my students when I want to illustrate what climate change might mean. Uh, what you see here is not the best case scenario, but it's not even the worst. So mostly this is, in my belief, what is going to happen if we don't change our economy dramatically. Oh, let's talk about Berlin, for instance. It may sound very appealing. Wow, Berlin will have climate like Rome. But believe me, infrastructure in Berlin is not made for Rome climate. People character in Berlin are not made for Roman uh, way of living. Not to mention people from Spain. I just don't want to have a climate like in, in the northern Sahara, do I? So it is global shift southward, but very with a lot, a lot of problems, just to give you an idea. Glasgow, I cannot avoid its elephant in the room. Have you ever asked yourself who holds the future of your children and your personal future in their hands? Well, here are the guys. Actually, there are one, two, three women and English queen. Maybe you can feel irony in my uh, speech. Anyway, a lot of these guys here are older. Can people, white males in their 70s, really care about the future? Who knows? 
let's hope they are aware uh, of their importance right now. Here is Greta, but she's too young. Queen, I will not comment her age. And here is Ursula, <laughs> at least uh, uh, something that uh, Europe can be really proud of. At the end of the conference, they did wave. You can see the expression on the face. Of course, they were hidden for two weeks in the room like this, and it ended. So negotiators really look happy because finally they can go home. But what was achieved in Glasgow, actually, from climate change or from climate science point of view? Uh, not much, but let me tell you why. Because you can see top emitters here. And if we say climate change began in 2000, of course we have to blame China. China is the biggest polluter. But climate change did not begin in 2000. It began 150 years ago, when emissions from China in global sense were practically zero. Emissions from India were zero, but who profited? from burning fossil fuels back then. UK, Germany, most European countries, and US. So how can we blame China now? Because we have to look at the perspective of last 100 years. So this is the first root of, uh, or, or problem why we don't get any results. Climate change was not born yesterday. And the second part of the problem is why is China having such a big emissions? Do they really consume what they produce? Uh -uh. You can see how carbon actually flows out of China because Europe imports products, US imports product. But it's very easy to be green when somebody else is producing your cars, your computers, your shoes, your clothes, etc., etc., And that's why it's a problem, because we have to acknowledge that China is not as guilty as it looks if we just look at this graph. And there are many other aspects, but that's why politicians are out there. They should negotiate, they should try. It's, I get this feeling that they are not aware of uh, this patience that we are expecting them to have to solve the problem. So after Glasgow, no more 1.5, believe me, but still there is a chance of 1.8, which is better than two. But only, only, if everything is implemented and all announced targets in the Glasgow will actually be uh, taken seriously, including cooperation between China and US. So optimistic bad case. But actually where we stand now, because nothing is delivered yet, is warming about 2.7 degrees global, which means local or in Europe, much more. So is Glasgow a success? Is it a glass half full, half empty? Uh, make your own opinion. But science is very clear about what should be done and what was not done in Glasgow. Uh, okay, so just to give a comparison with Russian roulette, I always tend to do that. So after the Glasgow, what is the probability that we will exceed two degrees warming? It's 90%, at least. But if we look what is actually going on in uh, some countries, like in Slovenia, we promised in Glasgow we will stop burning coal, but actually we are still burning it. So uh, our current policy pathway is different than what we actually targeted. And if we combine all countries together, we already see that we have 97% that we, we will exceed two degrees. So Russian roulette, we all know what Russian roulette is, I guess. What is the probability to survive with a Russian roulette? 83%, not so bad compared to climate change. Because our probability to survive, like a human race with the dignity, is only 3%. So it's more than Russian roulette, what actually world is playing 
now. To sum up all the bad news, five development tipping points. It's about food, obviously. It's about water, which already we experience in many uh, places. Extreme weather is here. Collapse of the ecosystems is possible. And in many developing countries, heat waves, uh, lack of food, lack of water actually causes more and more health risks, even in developed world, to be honest. Every summer, we have mortality of old people because of the heat waves, uh, even in the heart of European cities. But to put all that together in two words is displacement possible and poverty increased, which is something we should not be proud. But it's really funny. In 21st century, we should be discussing technology, all fine things, not do we have enough water, do we have enough food. I thought that was a question of Middle Ages, not questions of the 21st century. But we have a billion people undernourished, even without climate change. So uh, it's a funny world out there. OK, what should we do? We should mitigate, for sure. But we should also uh, try to adapt as soon as possible, because climate change is here. But if we don't do either, because there are some countries saying, well, we will not mitigate. It's too soon to adapt. Let's wait a little. It's actually you're choosing suffering, because suffering is something uh, you get when you don't use first two options. And with mitigation, there are many options. This is good news, because mitigation actually comes, one equation, from many factors. Mitigation is and we should think of, of, of how to approach, not just by switching to uh, renewable energy, but we have to actually look at to behavioral patterns as well. Number of people, demography is behavior. And of course, how rich we want to be, how much GDP per person we are, uh, we, we are willing to accept, it's also something that has to do with our culture. And of course, technology. I don't deny technology. Efficiency is number one. Renewable energy is number two. But we have to combine, because the world is very different. In many European countries, we, are not, we cannot even think of decreasing, for instance, uh, fertility rate. But in many countries, this is an issue. We should not be silent about that. We should talk about that. Politicians should talk about that. Diplomats should talk about it, because reducing population growth is not such a huge problem. Maybe what they did in China was like elephants with porcelain, but you can do it in a different way. My grandmother, she had six brothers and six sisters. My mother, only one child, I only one child. What happened? Education happened, jobs for women happened, empowering of women happened. So it is quite easy if you want to do it. Reducing growth, ah, this is something that you will not win elections. If you promise, if you vote for me, uh, GDP will not grow. But does GDP really increase, make us happy? Is there a limit? I think Professor Stiglitz, uh, they did calculate it uh, actually, what is that financial limit? We should think about it, not in India. But this is European problem that probably we are living beyond our means. Efficiency is something that is actually extremely important for your future business. Because there will be several uh, business opportunity reducing uh, how much energy we use to make money, to be very uh, blind. And of course, we should substitute natural gas for oil and coal because it's better, but it's not green energy. We should actually use more and more renewables. I'm not sure about nuclear energy, but it is low carbon energy. But unfortunately, there are other problems with nuclear. And some technologies are promising how to capture CO2 in the chimney of one factory and put it below sea or below ground. But it is still uh, something to be tested. So, how many options, and 
how little negotiation about other options that, for instance, just uh, substituting, for instance, energy. Uh, 1.5, which is safer. Some, uh, some numbers I would like you to take away. Okay, we will, uh, I, I think the political language is, we will do everything in our power to preserve 1.5 degree goal. But this means that actually, right now, we should scale up investments in low carbon energy by factor five. 500%, not 10%, not 20%. And actually that renewables already in 250 would supply uh, much more than a half of our electricity and coal will be phased out. As a, uh, so this is what you have to do and this is not easy. And really talking just we have to do something, this is exactly what. European Green Deal is a way forward. It's an excellent idea, including the legislation that has to be changed. Especially, I'm really looking forward if there will be a political courage to actually introduce carbon border tax, because that will change a lot of things and actually energy taxation directive is also something that needs to be changed. Uh, Fit for 55 package is also excellent. For those of you who are not yet studied it, please do study it. Well, it's still under negotiation, but I guess we, are, we should be proud that we are Europeans, but before I, I uh, praise it too much, to be totally honest, as a climate scientist, FIT for 55 is not 1.5 direction. FIT for 65 would be. So, of course, science and uh, non-governmental organizations, they push even harder. But 55 is better than U.S., is better than any country uh, that was present in Glasgow. Just hope the negotiation will really be effective in European Union because national government role is crucial. Europe is not a magic, uh, uh, has not a magic touch. We, each of us has our national government and if they don't really mean to change attitudes toward climate change, then European directives won't help. But all you see on these graph is unpleasant. If I would be a president of government, I would hate to see that slide. Taxes, expenditure, green economy, new economy, no growth anymore, regulations. All this is not something that is easy, but it is necessary. And I really hope that uh, some countries who are already trying in Europe to water down the, this package will understand that is also about their future. They don't live on another planet. We all share the same one. So what risks are you as entrepreneurs about to see? Many risks. Of course, hazards, finance, operations, strategic decisions, all that will sooner or later have to account for climate change. Hazards risk is easy to understand. We all know what is flood, what is hurricane, what is drought. Financial risks, for me, is uh, much more complicated because loans, insurances, all sorts of uh, volatility of prices, this is something that you as economists know much more than me. But for sure it is connected with the climate change consequences. Operations. Operations depend on our customers, about continuity, we can fail with our products, we can lose our reputation if we don't take climate change seriously. And also, wrap up of this strategy, uh, your future strategy should really uh, take climate change into account because markets may shift. Uh, some products will no longer be uh, in favor and of course, 
uh, how public will react, we are not sure. We could, we could see at COVID how some things are irrational. Finally, business came with a vaccine business, okay, if I call it business. But then people said, no, I don't want to be vaccinated. So it's, 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 uh, it's uh, funny how people react. So be prepared for the risks, but also be prepared for new businesses because there will be also opportunities. You will probably have to change your existing business, at least to reduce negative impacts, but there will be already opportunities, not just bad things will happen, but there will be for sure possibilities for new businesses. For those who will be quick, who will understand the situation, for the laggards, things will not be as bright. Okay, here's a list of market opportunities I think that will be in the uh, in next year's important. I'm not a, an uh, expert on markets, but I know that if we want to increase resilience, even in our own homes, we need some new products. And of course, uh, there are so many risks arising, not just from weather, but also of not being prepared to the weather. So we need more advices. We need experts who can actually uh, foresee the different uh, futures. And of course, our uh, tastes will probably change, lifestyle will change, and we as a consumers will want different things. For instance, in Porto Roche, here when we are, last time I, took a, uh, I was swimming in the sea, was already October. Usually the season of swimming ended in the end of the August. So tourist season is getting longer and longer and this is surely one good market opportunity. Built environment, water, energy, transport, food and insurance. These are sectors that are promising. This is what analysis of different uh, economists showed. But it's logical because we will have to change the way we live, we will change, we will have to be careful with water. Uh, energy is already a problem with the high prices. We will have to really respond how to be not obsessed by mobility or how to do it in a more sustainable way. And insurance is sometimes the only possibilities to live more uh, safely because of the extreme weather, which is getting more and more extreme every day. And this is McKinsey uh, analysis, what will actually be the best product for manufactured goods. This is a very new study, a few weeks, more than months. Uh, not surprisingly, <laughs> what we will need in the next 10 years, batteries, batteries, but on the second place is insulation and efficient appliances. I'm not a big fan of electric cars, but I'm a big fan of insulation. For instance, because in the winter, you don't spend so much money for heating, but in summer, it's pleasantly cool, so you don't have to put air condition on. Heat pumps, infrastructure, a lot of possibilities out there and uh, regarding the capital expenditure, I think McKinsey, they know quite well how European money will be distributed in the future. So do not despair. There are a lot of things you can do, and I believe that your imagination will even go beyond these opportunities. And what you should be doing today or tomorrow or the day after tomorrow when you come home, well, one word would be decarbonize, but you should measure and manage your emissions. Every director of the firm should know my product or my firm yearly emits so many tons of CO2 and have a plan. I can reduce that by 10%, 20%, 30%. And do not look just yourself. Try to look the chain, look beyond your operations because we are not islands and speak up for climate policy. Do not be silent when all these packages will, for instance, in Europe be discussed. Don't be silent because we need you as a citizen, engaged citizen. Uh, otherwise, 
a short circle of politicians will probably lead the way. And be transparent. When you do something good for the environment, talk about it, show it, brag about it. It's not a bad thing because people listen and people tend to follow if practice is good. So you can do it a lot of things tomorrow. But you will probably need some help from the states. Demand that help because small and medium-sized businesses are still lacking political backing and monetary support. If not now, when? Because we have all these post-COVID funds, we have all these green budgets, and uh, there are very little excuse why medium or small size businesses should not get part of this support. Financial initiatives, tax, tax breaks, for instance. Uh, you should be rewarded if you are actually having your carbon offset program I was talking a minute ago. I think that you are a very well-organized society and you should put more pressure to get that support. Surely climate science can support you. I will now try to wrap up. And when I said everything that was correct, politically correct, now I will say some things deep down from my thoughts. What I really hate is hearing this sentence. A global recovery from the pandemic must be rooted in green growth. Boris Johnson said that, many people said in Glasgow, but growth, 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 repeatedly growth. Growth that is sometimes green, sometimes it is sustainable growth, but planet does not grow. So you cannot promote economic growth in the same sentence when you say, I'm fighting climate change. It does not go together. Because there is no such thing as a green growth. It is growth, but any growth is wiping green from the earth. There are a lot of economists saying the same thing, maybe from different angles. But it is time that we really think deeply, honestly, are, do we really have these benefits from growth? Yes, maybe 5% of world population. World is growing, economy has grown for 50 years. But as I said, one billion people undernourished. Where has all this GDP growth went? I don't know, maybe in Europe, maybe in some really uh, small portion of the world. So I really urge economists, try to find a new economic model, maybe circular, maybe degrowth model, whatever, but it's from climate change point of view, high time you do it. Uh, and also some mindset, I think, that should be saved, uh, should be changed. Because accumulation, maximization, uh, this is something that we've been living with uh, for a long time, but maybe we should think more how to distribute the wealth. Economy of extraction should maybe be replaced by economy of regeneration. And competition, competition, always we hear that also on European podium, maybe competition uh, is not doing that uh, in, for the in global sense uh, much good anymore. So I guess cooperation would be much more to expect in the future. There are a lot of reasons not to change. You know, I'm old enough. <laughs> I had a very long series of advising or of uh, similar lectures, and I really heard all these excuses. For instance, it's too ambitious. Or I don't know, very often when I talk about stopping economic growth, it's too radical. Or it is not our problem, we are a small firm. Or I don't know, you can pick one, it's too political when you talk about uh, European Union that should help small businesses. Or I don't know, we don't have the staff to monitor and so on. Yes, if you want, you will find an excuse but try not to, because finding an excuse is like walking your life with your eyes closed, because it's 21st century and the problems are here. 
Okay, so short summary. Climate change is here and it will get worse. Sorry to say that, but unfortunately scientific truth. Every year matters and every choice matters. So do not wait for 22 like they will wait in Glasgow. Because situation is critical, believe me, and uh, uh, we have to be more ambitious what we do. COVID did not help, but as I mentioned before, there is post-pandemic stimulus in many countries, so maybe that money can be really spent wisely. And if we are serious about saving the planet, uh, as I mentioned before, and what I say to my students, maximization is for the stupid. Because even when you're a small child of one year, you can grab your brother's cake and having uh, this is mine. So grabbing, maximizing is simple. Optimization is for the smart ones because you have to cooperate. You have to think all the possibilities and you should be aware of the real world uh, out there. Okay, my just uh, final advice before I stop. Aim high, but go fast. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Dear Professor Kaifes. So I, I invite uh, questions now, if... I, so, yes, yes I, I, dear Professor Kaifes Bogatai, uh, thank you very much for this very impressive Schumpeter Innovation in Enterprise lecture. With all due respect to the economists in this world, I think you might have started a trend of not only inviting economists to give this lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I always thought that I live relatively safe by not playing Russian roulette. But you have opened my eyes. I'm not. We are not uh, living safe. And uh, I think you also made it very clear that it's dealing with climate change, it's not optional. It's a, it's a need, uh, it's an issue of survival. And you also showed very impressively how unfair climate change is and how unsafe. And I, I, I will remember, you know, it's easy to be green if the, thing, the needs that, the things that we want are produced yes. elsewhere. Uh, but you also reminded us that we all have a contribution to make to face this, this challenge of climate change. Now I think it's great to have an opportunity to, for all of us to ask questions. I would like to invite you to come and use uh, a microphone that is, that, are posi that is positioned there and there. And it would be great if you could also uh, state your name um, and possibly an organization, the organization that you represent. Uh, I would actually uh, use the position that I'm standing here already <laughs> to start. Uh, with the first question. And um, it, it's hard to, to turn back the clock by 150 years when, as you said, uh, things really started to go wrong, very wrong. But uh, let's imagine just for a moment uh, to turn back the clock by 14 days. You mentioned COP26. Now, if we go back 14 days, we are just before COP26. What would you have hoped or expected to go differently? What, what would you have done differently if you could, if you could, have, could have run COP26? Yes, uh, COPs are very complicated. They, since Kyoto Protocol, they invented so many things to negotiate about. So they have an agenda packed with, I don't know, 20 items. But actually only two items are crucial. One is, as I mentioned, very specific targets what my country will do. And what I did expect in that, uh, in that regard was that countries make targets for two 
2030, because we have to act now. But it was allowed, because it's UN system, that some countries made their uh, commitments till year 2060, or even 2070. All these leaders who made that, uh, uh, that ambition will be dead by then, you know? So everybody should really show the cards, if I may say so. Uh, that would be my expectation. And the second thing that it is crucial is somehow to, because this historic guilt of developed countries should be now uh, recognized in the matter that we financially help countries with adaptation. So we know exactly, for instance, African countries or countries in the islands when with the sea level rise they will probably disappear, need financial help to adapt. And this financial help, okay, there were some uh, improvements, but this money is still just promised. It is not out there. Why uh, would I suggest that there should be even more money given to these countries than it is planned now? Because it's investment in our security. It's not that we just give this money away. But if we don't do it, they will be not able to adapt. So we will have even more extreme poverty, more migrants, more crises like we already have. So it is investment in our future, not in their, I don't know, uh, way of living. And uh, these two things are crucial. So very little uh, improvement on the first, but some improvement on the second. I just hope that countries will really deliver that money next year, not in 10 years or 20 years. So that is what I would do differently. Thank you. Now, now it's your turn, your chance to put a question forward. I see already the first question there, first two. And I suggest that uh, you already, then the next candidate, can, the next person can already go to the, to the, micro, to the other microphone. Thank you. Please, it's your turn. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Moitza Markeziti. I'm the Director of Sustainability and Innovator in the company Skraimeko, Slovenian company working and developing uh, energy solutions. Thank you very much for this lecture. Uh, we're one of the uh, finalists of uh, EPA awards in the section of Sustainable Transition. My question for today for you is, uh, we all know that the challenge that we have ahead of us, we're at the tipping point of will we make it or will we not make it? The challenge is so big that it's overwhelming and the timing is so short that it's even more overwhelming. And we know very much that we'll not make it if we stay in different um, banks of the river so this is why I really, I'm really happy that we went beyond the economical aspect of, of these lectures and we've invited Professor Dr. Lučka Karpes Bogatai. So my question is, what's your opinion? I think that we can only make it if we really connect all the disciplines together, if we really not just start working out of the box, but no box approach, that we really join all our knowledges together and start working together. I think this is one of the most crucial things that we need to do and not stay businesses and scientists and politicians and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you're right. I was talking about cooperation more than, but it's not just cooperation per se. It's sometimes I, I think that we need a thorough reform of our organization. If you look at governments around the Europe. You have Ministry for Environment, Ministry for Defense, Ministry for, I don't know, Economy. But climate change is the problem of them all. And they should not take it just from, I don't know, one point of view. And we, we, are, we should join the resources as well. So this is cooperation is for sure something that is needed, but also a bit more education. 
Our children, they learn in schools foreign languages, they learn mathematics, they learn a lot of things, but sometimes they are energy illiterate. I get my students who finished Matura, Arbitur, and they have never hold in their hands electric bill because mama pays for it. <laughs> yeah? So if we, if we don't produce the energy literate young people, but also uh, seniors, that we are easily fooled by some promises like this energy solution will solve that. And of course, climate literacy. So education, cooperation is something. But what is also missing is that we, as the citizens, we just criticize politicians. They don't do it. Or we criticize big businesses. They are doing harm to environment. But we do not activate. So activation, democracy is exactly that. This is not a girl that does things for you. It's just opportunity that you do it, that you raise your voice. And if not now, I don't know when. With all social media, with all things at our hands, it's much easier to do it. But still, we are lazy and we are waiting for magic solutions. But they do not exist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, your question. Hello there. Congratulations on the amazing uh, speech. I'm over here, by the way. Hi there. Oh, uh, sorry. So, <laughs> congratulations on the amazing lecture. I think it's going to uh, give the pace uh, of this assembly, uh, talking about sustainability transition. My name is Sotiris Kopatsaris. I'm 27 years old, and I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Future Hotels. And we try to decarbonize independent hotels and give them the economies of scale they need uh, to transition to sustainability. But all, and we also weave that with technology. I'm a hotelier myself, but I study mechanical engineering, so I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with technology and I'm a huge advocate for it. Uh, and I'm saying that because as, as, as an engineer, we noticed that there was nothing that was too technical to solve, and that was nothing too hard to solve once there were the resources to make that happen. So I realized that sustainability is not so much a technical problem as it is a business problem. And the question here is, what would be the next game changer technology that you could predict possibly that would change our fortunes. When we invented the wheel, we exited the caves, we started a revolution from that. When we invented agriculture, what's the thing that we're gonna invent that's gonna change our fortunes and these very, very bad projections in the future? And if we don't know what this uh, invention could be because we're not fortune tellers, what do you think should be the area of focus in terms of all that, you know, using the Pareto principle, perhaps the 20, 80% impact, what should be that 20% we need to go and change with technology to give us 80% of the impact. Uh, and the countries that manage to make that happen, will they be the ones to be the leaders and the competitive uh, growth leaders in that green energy growth perhaps? If we have this technology as European Union, as, as a block of countries, we will be the leaders to, to capture that. So is there green growth in there perhaps? Sorry for the, for the complicated question, but yeah, so, so thank you. Yeah, what, what we actually need, and I hope that technology will uh, be able to meet is a source of a really clean energy. So, for instance, uh, uh, we were hoping that ITER project with uh, nuclear fusion will make it. But uh, to be honest, maybe there is still a chance that that will happen. I don't know if you are uh, aware of financing of this project, because Europe did not give much money to that project. Actually, it got years back I remember the amount of money that was equal to spending subsidies for transport for 12 minutes, you know, it was a yearly budget. So yes, this is a wishful thinking maybe, but technology should really go into the energy efficiency. So we should, there's a lot of things possible. You just remember the first computers. So they were, you know, they would fit this room. Now the computer is so small that you can hardly see it. And of course, much more efficient. So efficiency is something that should be legally binding, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter when you are making a new hotel, it should be energy efficient, a new car, whatever. But for instance, what, what we do with cars, I said, I said that I'm not a big fan so much of electric cars, but actually I'm not a big fan of any new car. I used to drive Fiat Panda. 
It was a very nice car, especially for parking. <laughs> I'm not a big <laughs> driver. But you know, every new model was five centimeters wider and 100 kilos heavier. And this goes on and on. So whatever efficiency we gain with the, our better motors, we lose it because cars are getting bigger or, 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 or heavier. I mean, this is a message because we should not do it. And uh, so this is partly an answer, but when you answer, uh, when you said you're a hotelier and that you are really interested to lower your carbon footprint, sometimes it's also important the priorities. Because actually you can make your hotel carbon neutral. But where is the problem? The problem is your visitors who will travel to your hotel from China. So it's not the hotel you should be worrying about, it's the trip. So sometimes people concentrate on important things, but out of the scale, you know what I mean? So try always to tackle the most important things first. Not, it's, it's not time for details to start there. So I hope I, I answered, but it's, uh, I wish I knew the correct answer, because I hope that technology uh, will play a key role. Let's hope for it. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure all the entrepreneurs in the room would have been very interested also in the getting the idea, ha, now my next business. Yes. <laughs> Please, your question, ideally short and to the point. Thank you. Uh, David Caro, European Small Business Alliance. Uh, 18 months ago, we probably had the greatest experiment in energy efficiency we could possibly have envisaged with a three-month lockdown. Yes. No industry, very little transport, no flights, uh, a warm spring, so home energy use was much down, yet we only saved 15% of the carbon being admitted into the atmosphere. I think we're missing a chance here to reanalyze where we should be looking to make the savings. I'm not saying that what you have already presented here shouldn't be done at all, but I think we should be looking deeper into where the real savings can be made, because 15% is not going to get us to 25 Mm -hmm. We need to look at much greater savings, but we need to see where those are coming from. And I think with that experiment, if you wish to call it that, of a three-month lockdown, we're not looking at the results of that close enough. Mm -hmm. We could never have done something like that and planned it and, and produced it to see what happened. And we should be looking at the effects of that, forgetting the, the pandemic. And we should actually be saying maybe the pandemic has helped us in looking at the ways mm -hmm. we can analyze those figures better and produce better savings and where we can make those savings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah you're, you're very correct because uh, we should analyze and we will probably because COVID is still going on. Uh, actually, I, I found that three, three months lockdown in Europe producing 12% uh, was quite a lot. But it did not really, it was not felt in CO2 concentration in the air because actually China they did not have a lockdown at all uh, regarding industry. There was some lockdown. They only had lockdown for two weeks in February, uh, in March. So that's why probably globally uh, we did not feel. But we could see it made a huge uh, progress lockdown with local problems. For instance, air was suddenly clear. You could see fishes in Venice Lagoon. So people get the, got this feeling that it's not too late for local problems, but for global not. So yes, how to tackle the right thing? I think that it is not a universal question, because if you look at the industry point of view, every product is made in a bit different way, but we do not perform life cycle analysis for the products. It is not mandatory, but it should be, because when firms would do that, and when I go to shop, and if I have a choice of buying, I don't know, uh, like board for my kitchen when I, I, I cut my onions, and there's a plastic one, there's a wooden one, there's, I don't know, a stone one, there's a, a tag with a price today. But it should be another tag with CO2 emissions needed to produce. And then I could choose what is environmentally more friendly, not which one is the cheapest, because a lot of people have that for choice. And such analyses are not mandatory, not even in you. And that's why it's hard, actually, then to say you are more to blame with your product than my product. But uh, 
uh, this can be changed very quickly. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, there was not enough data. For instance, if you have a car which was partly produced in Europe, partly in China, partly, I don't know, somewhere else in Japan, and then just put together, now you have a database when actually each part of the car can be traced, can be followed, including CO2 emissions. And of course, you have then different uh, carbon footprint, and people can decide, okay, as a consumer, what I should buy. But at a, at a national level, we should not subsidize this factory which makes such a dirty products, for instance. So we need numbers, and we need calculations which were 10 years ago impossible, but now they are possible. We have the knowledge, we have the data, but we don't have this political or entrepreneur will to do it. So I, I hope I did answer what you meant. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one last question, please. Thank you. Um, thank you also very much for the inspiring uh, uh, lecture. Um, normally, I'm grumbling all the time during these speeches, uh, voicing my ideas. But this time, I was quite silent, I must say. Uh, but nevertheless, I think you put forward already some, some great first solutions and steps that entrepreneurs can, can set. Uh, I'm Veronique Willems, by the way, from SME United, uh, the uh, organization of crafts and SMEs in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, what we see among our membership is that entrepreneurs, of course, are waiting to invest until they have a, a bit of certainty whether their investment will be the right one for the next few years. On top of that, we had the COVID crisis, which also impacted uh, many of their uh, investment capacity. So, as you mentioned, the funds will be crucial to allow to, to have those investments. But keeping the discussions on targets and who will deliver which targets uh, ongoing and not getting to the level of what are the concrete steps that entrepreneurs uh, have to take, do you believe that 2030 is feasible? And, and which steps and which behavioral changes do you recommend and, and how do you recommend? Because of course that means that we wouldn't be here probably in the room traveling from all over Europe, but that something else would have happened. How do you propose to have those behavioral changes uh, put in place? Mm -hmm. Because 20 years ago, I was not traveling with my parents. Now, my parents would be traveling with me because it's a lot more democratic prices for flights, etc., etc. So how do you see that evolution towards the future? Yeah, well, if we, if we are to succeed to solve the ecological crisis, we will have to bring external uh, costs into the price of the products. This is for sure. Because also this part of economy has evolved, so we know exactly what is the right price of one kilowatt hour of electricity coming from thermonuclear power plant. But we don't charge that. So uh, external expenses should be included, and then it will be quite a new economy. Of course, then things will change. But you cannot do it on your level as an entrepreneur. But you have to ask for that. Because uh, especially in case of transport or uh, electricity production, uh, it's very clear. And of course, this price of carbon is formed uh, when we have this uh, 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 different uh, organizations actually uh, with uh, carbon credits that they are actually impacting this price. I'm not really sure how it works, but there was no, actually no real climate action or talking about uh, stopping burning coal when price of CO2 ton was 8 euros. But now, when it's up to 50, 60, uh, euros per ton, suddenly people realize that we will have to shut down some. Uh, so this is one thing that you should be as entrepreneurs actually also ask from governments, not just support, but to change the attitude, what is the real price of the product. But to change behavior, in my opinion, it is usually the best practice to interact with your customers or, or your colleagues in the way that you search from win-win uh, solutions. So whenever you, you spend or, or you need more, uh, less electricity, you actually save money. When you travel less, you save money. So this notion of uh, actually being awarded immediately after I cut 
my missions by having more money is in a way it's working. Not maybe with all people, but majority, I guess, yes. So look for win-win solutions and same go for your personal business. Because if you decarbonize with these prices of uh, uh, electricity or gasoline, surely you, you can make some savings. But these win-win combinations very much differ from country to country. So it's not the same logic applied, I don't know, in Ireland or in Greece, uh, if you just look at the Europe. Uh, so demanding sort of a new economic model, this will also give you more certainty what to do in the future. But even before it happens, it is, I guess, extremely important that you know your footprint, carbon footprint, you are talking about carbon footprint, but there is also water footprint, because water will be the next problem after we fix the carbon. To know your footprint, to know your costs associated with that, your risk associated with that, and then to make a plan of reduction. So it uh, depends on the, uh, how ambitious you will be. But to 30, 65% less, divided by eight years, 8% 8 per year, to be exact, this would be a target to follow. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear professor. Thank you for your attention. And I suggest let's continue the discussion at the SME Week reception now. Thank you.